both the art and the science of functional medicine. Here's your host, Dr. Brad Watts. Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Dr. Brad Watts with the Nutrition Hero Podcast. Thank you for tuning in today. Thank you for being part of this project. I appreciate it, obviously, as always. Today, I'm excited to be bringing some information to you that I was able to share in front of a group called the FM Shift this past April in Arizona. And uh, and it was a message that was timely, number one. But then number two, the group that I was talking to, some of the biggest and most successful functional medicine practices in the world, and being able to bring them information that they've never heard before, number one, is a a challenge. (laughs) And then number two, making sure that the information allows them to build something, to change who they are, to walk away different than they were when they walked in. And so today we're going to go through some of the similar information. I'm going to give it to you in a a similar format, similar manner, and um, and I'm excited about it. So it's life-changing information. It's stuff that's coming out of this book that I've been writing for what seems like an eternity now called Killing Chronic Disease. If you'd like more information about that, you can go to drbradwatts.com. drbradwatts.com. It'll forward you to the book site. Put in your information there, get a chapter of the book, and start reading through, and let the information change who you are. There's this thing that happens when you learn something new. This thing where you have a choice when you're presented with information you've never heard before. And that choice is either, one, you put your hands out and you prevent it from affecting who you are, and you say, nope, I'm good. I'm good with where I am right now. The second choice is is you, you let it hit you, percolate for a little while, change who you are so that you can be better than you were yesterday, helping people in a different manner than you did yesterday, and improving as society improves. And so this is something cool because what happens is, is as physicians, typically, uh, natural healthcare practitioners, doctors, coaches, whatever you are, society we live in is going to pass you by at some point. At some point, most people stop learning. And when you stop learning, it's only a matter of one to three years before you're out of the game, before you have been passed by when it comes to the process with which you help people. And so I don't care what industry you're in, one to three years. And um, and one of the things that you're going to find is, is that as you let this information hit you today and change who you are and the way that you operate, the way that you participate with people, is this is this is part of the evolution of a nutrition hero. And this podcast, I know it says nutrition hero like I'm the nutrition hero, but this podcast is really about you and it's about making you, highlighting you and your nutrition hero status in your community and serving people in a way that you wouldn't have been able to otherwise. And so that's what the whole heart of this is all about. And that's what I get so excited about in communicating with doctors. I get to speak on a monthly basis around the country, communicating information like you're about to hear today to physicians, coaches, MD, DC, DO, whatever you are. And, and it's something that um, I don't take lightly. And so it's a privilege, and I want to share in that privilege with you today so that you have an opportunity to hear something that I don't think you've ever heard before. All right, so today, um, if you want more information on this stuff, like I said, go to drbradwatts.com. That's cool. Next piece of the puzzle is is making sure that you five-star us on iTunes. Give us a five-star review if you like the podcast. If you don't like the podcast, then don't listen. <laughs> so, all right, go ahead and do that. Hit subscribe on the YouTube button if you're one of the YouTube listeners. We have like 0.05% of our audience on YouTube. So if you liked uh, that style of participation, then go ahead and, and dig in on that. Thumbs up on YouTube and uh, certainly hit that subscribe button. Let us know that you're listening. So, all right. Without any further to do, we're going to get into this uh, topic today called From Dictator to Super Coach. A couple of things before we get started, just to handle a few items of information here. The future of healthcare, the future of business is reserved for those that have figured out, have learned how to move past the strictly material. People that have learned how to move past, quote unquote, the hard skills. When you can get into the soft skills and understand the lay of the land, 
and how to operate within that lay of the land. This is where the healthcare industry is headed, right? As everything gets more and more automated in medicine, you're going to find that there's a lack of soft skill. And that soft skill is what we on the Nutrition Hero podcast want to make sure that we are participating in. So super cool. Same thing in business. You find it all over the place. So a couple of things um, with the historic progression of where medicine has been. Just I want to highlight a few things here for you. 1796, Dr. Edward Jenner figured out how to turn off smallpox, right? It was killing 20 to 40% of the world's population. And that's a huge step in the right direction. 1796. 1846, let's go up about 50 years here. 1846, William Morton figured out how to operate under general anesthesia. How important was that for like quality of life purposes? No longer getting people hammered on whiskey before you, you put them under the knife. But we figured out a way to have them go to sleep before you cut into them. How cool is that? Quality of life taking a huge step forward in the middle of the 1800s. 1895, we go down the road another 50 years or so, and we got D.D. Palmer. He steps into the scene as a chiropractor, I have to mention this. Improves the quality of life for millions of people over the next 125 years. That's cool. You gotta like that. All right. How about 1928? Alexander Fleming discovers penicillin raising like life expectancy from 47 years old in 1928 to 78 years old in just a few decades. That's a phenomenal step in the right direction for quality of life. 1955, Jonas Stalk figured out how to stop polio from destroying the population of the Western world. How cool is that? Right? We'll talk about turning diseases off for the power of mankind, for the quality of life. Huge. 1973, MRI technology shows up in clinics, and how many people has that helped over the last 55 years or so? Tons. Absolutely tons. And it's stunning to think about the technology advances from 1796 turning off smallpox to 1973 with MRIs to 2019 where we are today where we're talking about new and different diseases, right? So bacteria, viruses, anesthesia, imaging, all of this stuff we can lump into what I'm going to call done-for-you healthcare, stuff that's done to the patient or for the patient by somebody else. Done-for-you healthcare. And the information age of the 1980s shows up after, you know, 1973 MRIs, and now we're starting to use this technology in the 80s. We start to have a dissemination of information pretty freely, pretty freely. And what's interesting is, is that healthcare begins to change. One of the things I want to make sure that you write down, just take this to the bank. As monetary prosperity increases, the diseases that afflict the masses become more complex. Type 2 diabetes used to be a disease for kings. Gout used to be a disease for kings, right? And kings had the money to spend on the physicians to help them with their rare and unique pathologies. And so what we found, though, is that in the 1980s, as information starts to expand and then the prosperity of the United States specifically starts to expand, you start to see new and different diseases showing up that are afflicting the masses. It's no longer polio that we're worried about. Right, these rare things that are not necessarily lifestyle related, it's the lifestyle diseases that show up. It's the lifestyle diseases. So there are a whole host of doctors that are out there right now, coaches, nutritionists, etc., that are digging in on chronic disease, and it's it's a brave new world. It's really the advent of a new form of healthcare. And it's young at this point. It's still very young. It's like less than 35 years old right now. And this is super important because the people that are considered pioneers in this industry have only been doing it for 35 years. They've only been doing it on the mass scale for 35 years. And so functional medicine is even younger than this iteration of lifestyle care. And so this is what I get excited about because if you're listening to this podcast and you are acting as that nutrition hero in your community, You are on the forefront of this. You are what's going to be talked about 100 years from now. That's you, right? So I throw those names out there, Edward Jenner, William Morton, D.D. Palmer, Jonas Stalk. You, I'm talking about you because we're at the front end of this thing, and it's exciting. 
It's super exciting. So the current progression is somewhat stunning. And right now we've moved from a single nutrient, single action progression back in like the, the early 80s to this whole lifestyle involvement where we're not just giving people magnesium anymore and being like, there, that'll fix it. We're looking at herbal blends and blending that in with a lifestyle that says you should eat a certain way, you should live a certain way. What's interesting is, and this is really where I want to take this in the future here in the next couple of decades, is it's not just about what you're putting in your body, it's also what's coming out of your body with your words and your thoughts and how that actually changes the expression of DNA in your physical body and that DNA expression changes the proteins that are coded and changes the hormone structures. It's amazing. And so this is this is so cool where this is headed. But what I want to do is I want to highlight this. This is the new healthcare. This is first world healthcare. This stuff that we're doing right now, it doesn't really exist in the third world because they haven't had the financial prosperity and the information accessibility that we have in the United States for the past 30 years. And and so they haven't developed these diseases to the same extent yet. And it's happening. You look at these nations that are starting to become uh, industrialized, if I can say that as a, a term, these nations that are just tuning in to the industrialization of their economy, uh, they are not far behind with these diseases, right? Third world, though, it doesn't exist yet. So in this first world healthcare, in this new healthcare model, patients can't be passive any longer. I mean, they can if they want to stay sick, but if they want health in the life that they see on TV and Instagram, right, they're going to have to make sure that they're active in this. They cannot remain passive. It's not about sitting there and doctor do something to me any longer. It's about participation. It's about communication. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful, right? And as we're doing this on a daily basis in our communities, because there's so many people that are afflicted with this stuff now, right, these chronic diseases, we may not be famous, right, like Louis Pasteur that I mentioned, or Edward Jenner with the smallpox. Might not be famous, but I want you to remember something. You are stinking famous to the families that you serve. You are famous to them. And if you are somebody that is is like engaging in this for the greater good, right? I'm not talking about the people that are just in it for the cash. I'm talking about people that are in it for the greater good, making a legacy, having a lasting legacy in your community. You are famous to these families that you're serving. And I want you to remember that. That should hit you in a way that inspires you to go back out there and keep doing what you're doing, right? This new healthcare model requires some inspiration because that inspiration leads to you developing these soft skills. So we have hard skills and soft skills in this new healthcare model. You're going to have both, but the problem is, is that your community expects you to have the hard skills. And so when a doctor gets excited about the hard skills and they are, they're stuck on those, like, what makes you so awesome, doctor? Well, it's because I'm better at reading blood chemistry than anybody else or whatever. Nobody cares, <laughs> okay? Nobody cares. It's about cultivating your bedside manner or your tableside manner. It's about cultivating these soft skills and your ability to connect with people. The best physicians in the world, right, that I've met, and I've met literally thousands of doctors over the years, you guys, and the best ones in the world, not the ones that have the longest curriculum vitae, the longest... Um, you know, list of accomplishments. They're not the best ones in the world. The best in the world are the ones that have figured out how to communicate with somebody, cause a lifestyle change, get the person to buy into it from a follow-through perspective, and change their life. It's phenomenal, right? There's another way that there's a word that we can use for this, and it's called coaching, right? So the title of today's presentation, this podcast today, is moving from dictator to super coach because I think that in order for you to be the best that you can be over the next 10 years, you legitimately have to move from being a dictator to a super coach. Dictators are interesting, right? I'm a recovering dictator, <laughs> okay? But it never works out for dictators. See North Korea, see China, uh, where they have been, right? Uh, Cuba, Venezuela right now, the guy's living in a palace, but his people are eating dogs in the streets, right? And I'm not, not from a political perspective. I'm just saying from a human perspective, something's not right, right? And so being a dictator always leads to destruction in the long run. It always does, right? So I hear a couple of points for you that I want you to, to know about, and then we're going to get into how to know if you're a dictator. Number one, 
Dictators always lead to codependence. Dictators always lead to codependent patients, and, and that's the death knell of a nutrition practice. That's the death knell of a functional medicine practice. One of the things that I found is, is that codependency is a very quick way to making sure that you don't have any time at all. When your patients will come to you for everything but toilet paper and bananas, that's, that's a problem, right? Unless you teach them how to think, uh, critically think on their own, that's a problem. If they're coming to you with every single question about volume of water to volume of protein on a daily basis because you're not giving them a structure, you're giving them rules, that's a humongous issue, right? And and you're going to end up with, you know, 3,000 patients, right, which is great, huge practice, but the practice is going to make like $5,000 a month. You're going to be poor. Your business is going to suffer, and then ultimately you're not going to be able to help patients. I've seen it seen it time and time again. Dictators always lead to codependent patients, and that is going to kill your practice. Okay, Not only that, but it's not doing your patients any service. If they need you to survive, what good are you? Right? You didn't teach them anything. So very important. You're only, as a functional medicine provider, you're only as good as your last patient. And I want you to remember that. You're only as good as your last patient. Now, Here's how to know if you're a dictator. And this this cuts close to the heart for me because, like I said, I'm a recovering dictator. And this is something that I had to discover about eight years ago. I was sitting in a pa- in a practice full of co- patients that were codependent. And I was like, I don't have any room to add new patients. I don't know how this is going to work in the future. How am I going to help these people? right? And, and these are some things that I had to come to grips with. Okay, and then I'll show you a way out of it here as we get to the end of this today. But how to know if you're a dictator. So this is kind of like the Jeff Foxworthy thing. You might be a redneck if. You might be a dictator if. Right? You appeal to reason and logic all day as if that's ever enough. Like when's the last time that you got goosebumps or one of your patients got goosebumps? When's the last time that you had a tear in your eye as you're connecting with your patients? If all you're doing is A plus B equals C all day long, right, and just talking about the mechanics of what you're doing, appealing to the reason and logic of your patient, you are a dictator and it's going to bite you at some point, right? It's going to. And and you might be that person that's sitting out there right now going, well, I'm not a dictator. I'm just a very logical doctor. That's cool. You're a dictator, buddy, right? And and it's going to bite you at some point. You're only going to be able to help people that can say yes, Right? That's not the job of a doctor, being only, only able to help people that can say yes. Your job is to help save the people that can't even say yes to themselves. Like They don't even understand right, that they are their own problem oftentimes in a lifestyle setting. Right? The lack of responsibility that a patient has is usually in direct proportion to the doctor's reason and logic. All right, so listen to that again. Hit rewind on here. Hit the back 15 seconds button on your iP- on the uh, iTunes app. But that is that is something I want you to take to heart. Okay, so here's another one. You might be a dictator if right you take responsibility for the patient's health. If you take responsibility for the patient's health, you're a dictator. Right? Think about it. The dictators. Think about patient's health and the economy versus a like like the like an economy in a dictatorship, right? Patient's health is the economy in a dictatorship. So the dictators, when the economy is awesome, they're always like, "We are phenomenal. I'm the best leader ever, and I'm going to pass this this dictatorship, this country, down to my son, and then he's going to do the best thing for this country when I die, right? And it's going to be this family legacy. But we're not going to call it a family business. We're just going to call it Venezuela or Cuba." Right, And what happens is, is they're taking responsibility for the good times. And then when everything goes south, like in Venezuela right now, well, it's not my fault. It's this country's fault. It's that country's fault. Like the dictator never understands that the crappy part when, they're, when their country goes south, right? It's because they don't know how to deal with other nations, right? They don't know how to communicate. And a dictator never knows how to communicate with the people they really need to be communicating with. Right? They just set up a bunch of rules and stuff, and they force people into a structure. You might be a dictator if you take responsibility for the patient's health. And I want to make sure that we understand this, that that is wrong. 
You are wrong because when you take responsibility for the patient's health, you also have to be willing to take responsibility when that patient sucks, right? When they're sick, okay? A dictator, you can't have it both ways, right? You have to take responsibility in in both situations. You can't just take the good and deny the bad, right? That's a true mark of a dictator right there. Take the good, deny the bad. Right. What I want you to think about here is, is that you are not actually responsible for the health and healing of the patient. It's that the, the power that heals the edges of a cut together in the patient's body that's responsible for it. You are accountable to working with it, but you're not responsible for it. What's interesting is, is that if you have the capacity to remain accountable to innate intelligence is what I call it, or to that power in the body that heals the edges of a cut together, if you can remain accountable to that thing, Right, your patients are going to get well consistently. Maybe not 100% of the time, but consistently better than they had been. And it's amazing. right? You are not responsible for the health and healing, but you are certainly accountable to the power in the body that is. That's your job. right? Dictators get it backwards every time. All right, here's how you know you're a dictator. You might be a dictator if you're constantly facing food questions. If you constantly get questioned about the diets you put your patients on or they complain or push back on it, you're a dictator, dude, right? You are a dictator. And when you are constantly, like, fighting this, that means that food is stronger at communication than you are. Right? That means chicken nuggets are stronger at communication than you are. I say chicken nuggets because that's the one that burned me back in the day, right? Patient would just wouldn't be able to follow the diet. And I didn't know how to communicate to them in a way. And he goes, Dr. Watts, I can get 10 chicken nuggets for a dollar and 14 cents. Why would I ever listen to what you have to say? That hit me like a ton of bricks. And I was like, what? He doesn't get it. And then I said, I don't get it. If I don't get it and I can't communicate to him, I'm losing to a piece of chicken. All right, it's not even real chicken. <laughs> not even real chicken. And so what had to happen is, is I had to come to grips with my ability to communicate with a patient and decide and understand that when I'm constantly facing pushback on food in a coaching setting, it's because I'm a dictator, I'm not a coach, right? And it's, it's amazing because food appeals to the innate needs of a patient, right? Not necessarily health needs, but their innate emotional needs for sure, their desires, right? Food communicates to their desires more than the desired outcome. Think about that in a different way. Food speaks to the now when your coaching strategies have to speak to the now and to their desired health outcome in the future. So you're, you're like behind the eight ball right away in communication if the patient has an interesting relationship with food. It's cool though, When you can figure it out. So if you're constantly facing food questions, you're a dictator, right? Uh, Refunds, this is another one. This one's kind of a a tough one to talk about for some people, but refunds. If your patients are constantly refunding care from your office, you're a dictator, right? Nobody wants to fund a dictator. Like, do you understand that? One of the reasons why we have so many people trying to come into the United States right now and the government's all up in arms about it, et cetera, is because these people living in these dictatorships, they don't want to fund a dictatorship, Right, like Venezuela, people are fleeing Venezuela. Almost a half million people in the in the uh, over the last couple of years here. That's amazing. It's because they don't want to fund a dictatorship, right? One of the reasons is is that a dictator never lives the lifestyle that they demand from their subjects. A dictator never lives the lifestyle that they demand from their subjects. Right? That should hurt you a little bit because what I find is is that most doctors, nutritionists, functional medicine providers don't live the lifestyle that they demand out of their patients. Okay, super interesting. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, You might be a dictator if, here's another one, all right, you hate the mini government you're running, right? If you wake up and you're like, ugh, it's Monday, I gotta go back to work today. Ugh, don't wanna do that, right? You might be a dictator, okay? If you can't love the service arm of who you are, that's what your clinic is, by the way, is a service arm of who you are. If you can't love the service arm of who you are, Right, you gotta you gotta get out. You gotta get out. Can't do it. Okay, if you hate the mini government you're running, like it's Thursday again, I gotta see Karen again. Karen's back. What in the world? How is it Thursday already? Okay. You might want to think about how you're running things. Um and a little less dictatorship would be awesome. What happens is you see in dictatorships uh, globally, 
right? You see that the, the dictators eventually end up hating the people that they're supposed to be serving because what happens is is they it starts to change where the people are now serving the dictator and and they start to develop animosity to it and it's like on the inside of that dictator's heart they know it's wrong right they know that they can't keep forcing the masses to serve them and their interests okay and so they start to develop a resentment for the masses well that happens all the time in healthcare that's why you get so many doctors that have such huge egos and terrible bedside manners because they're like, oh, I'm gracing you with my presence today, patient. Don't test my patience, right? <laughs> and it's weird. It's a weird dynamic, but you see it all the time. And, um, and usually the more money that a doctor makes, the more that that happens. And it's the truly special providers that can make a lot of money, serve a ton of people, and remain committed to the service arm rather than serving their patients rather than well my patients fund my lifestyle that's wrong that's wrong all right it's a wrong mentality okay it's a wrong mentality if you want to do that go own a gas station or something like that right like i just i want to throw that out there because to me in my heart of hearts you have to be committed to your patients at all costs Right, And that's tough to say because most providers are committed, but to a point, to a point. It's got to be at all costs. So you might be a dictator, okay, if. So that's the little section here that we went through, and I just want to review real quick. So if you're writing things down, if you only appeal to reason and logic, if you, take, if you try to take responsibility for the patient's health, if you're constantly facing food questions, if you're constantly facing refunds from your patients, if you're constantly hating the mini government that you set up, you might be a dictator, all right? So I got a few guidelines here, three or four guidelines, how to step out of the dictatorship role, how to have a practice, right, that allows you to be a servant of humanity, right, and have fun and get paid for it at the same time. All right, so you're going to have to practice these things on yourself before you can actually communicate these uh, effectively to other people, especially your patients, because most of the time your patients are sick because they're dictators as well. All right, so that's a little secret there for you. Most of the time your patients are sick because they are also dictators. Now, you got to practice these on yourself, all right, and then effectively you'll be able to learn them, put the mechanics into place, and, um, and move in the right direction. The language that you use in this stuff is up to you, but I'm going to communicate in a language that works with me and my brain and my heart and we'll move this in the right direction um, the essence of what we're about to to go through here is this the brain thinks but the heart knows okay the brain thinks and the heart knows and and uh, that's the essence of what we're going to talk about and if you're stuck in your brain all the time right you're going to be a dictator so all right number one for the love of all that is holy <laughs> Live the lifestyle that you're selling. Live the lifestyle that you're recommending to your patients. Live the lifestyle. If you are somebody that is in an adjustment-based practice as a chiropractor and that's your thing, you have to get adjusted. You have to. I'm going to show you why here in a minute, but you have to. Okay. If you're somebody that's selling functional medicine or you're, you're working with recommendations of lifestyle programming, you have to live the lifestyle you're recommending to your patients. Well, doctor, I customize the lifestyle, so there isn't one cookie-cutter version. Okay, then customize your own lifestyle based off your own tests and your own supplements and your own food, right? You have to do that to yourself. It's about congruency, all right? It's about a frequency match. How about that for a, a language that most people can't let in their head, <laughs> all right? Uh, super important here, Okay. You must live the lifestyle you're selling. It has to move from head knowledge into beingness. Right? You have to communicate from who you are, not from what you know. Now, here's, here's the thing. Right? Your heart has this electromagnetic frequency that we might have talked about before in the podcast, but you haven't. You can look at, uh, if you haven't heard about it, you can look at uh, like heart math, right? if you've ever heard of this stuff. So there's this electromagnetic frequency that creates a field around your body and it goes six to eight feet outside your body when it's strong and healthy in all directions and you're walking around like your body is basically bathed in this electromagnetic field it's measurable you can see this stuff in imaging okay and and so it's not hocus pocus stuff this is just it's it's science you can measure it the point is is that it's there okay 
this field is what your patients feel in your clinic, right? How many patients have you been able to help because they walk in and they understand that you get where they're talking about, okay? And so, so many times doctors want to know, what do I say? How do I help this patient? How do I communicate to them? You communicate by who you are. This is what I'm talking about, this electric magnetic field around your body, okay? You communicate with who you are, right? That communicates like 90% of the information that's being transferred between people is happening because of who you are, not by the words that you say, all right? This is so important. This is why when a patient, you get, you meet somebody for the first time, you got like 30 seconds before the patient's made up their mind whether or not they like you. It's because they're feeling who you are, and most of the time it's subconscious. Like, they don't understand. They're not taking an inventory and being like, I like this, I like that, right? They just know one way or the other. They go, nah, I'm in or out right away, right? It's because you're moving from head knowledge. I know what to do to help a patient reverse their diabetes, okay? But it's not enough to know it. I have to be it, okay? Do you understand where I'm going with this? When I am it, when I'm being it, the patient feels it as well. How do I be it, right? How am I the thing I'm communicating to the patient? Practicing the lifestyle I'm living. I think it, I speak it, I eat it, all right? I exercise it. Okay, so when I walk into a room, the patient's coming in, con- like face to face, coming into confrontation with the lifestyle that is their way out of the situation they're in. That is so powerful. This is the future of healthcare, just so you know. This is the future of healthcare. How many patients have you had that have walked into your office and said, I just can't take it. My doctor that's given me diabetes medication is 300 pounds. Why am I getting recommendations from them? Right? It's because they understand that their doctor is not being the resolution, okay? Be the lifestyle you're selling. You gotta live it, man. All right, so that's number one. Number two, start with the end in mind. Start with the end in mind for your patient's uh, progression. So let's think about your health for a second. Okay, start with the end in mind. Circular patterns of operation are absolutely necessary. So put a pen on a piece of paper and draw at the the top of the, the paper here, draw a circle and before you connect that circle again, draw an arrowhead. Right, so it looks like a circular arrow. Now, this is the the format in which your body functions with very well. Your body is something that is designed to live in perpetuation, right? It's not in linear linear progression, it's in perpetual progression. Like the cells of your body replace themselves every six to nine years, and that's great. It's a perpetuation of life. If it was just linear, right, the cells would never replace themselves, and so you would just basically burn out like a AA battery, okay? So this this is uh, something that is coming out of the languages. The oldest written languages on the face of the planet understood this perpetuation in linear progression, okay? Or excuse me, (laughs) in circular progression. Your body functions in circular patterns. Linear patterns showed up with this Aristotelian way of thinking that our entire education system is based off of, where you have a major definite starting point, draw an arrow, fate going from left to right, and a, an unknown future, okay? And this unknown future is, and I want you to just zoom out and get this here for a second, okay? This unknown future is where your patients are stuck, okay? Your patients are stuck in this unknown future. For, for instance... The unknown future, this linear thinking says anything is possible, but nothing is certain. Right? If anything's possible and nothing is certain, all that leaves room for is speculation and fear. Right? Diabetes is reversible, but anything is possible, but it's not certain in my case. Right? So now your patient has these apprehensions. Okay? Problem is, is their brain thinks in linear left to right progression. Their body does not think in that manner. Their body, right, the DNA of your body thinks in this circular, circular pattern. The circular pattern is absolutely imperative to, to dial into here, okay? So the circular pattern, this is how we know this, is the quantum model of operation, this, the quantum mechanics, 
is based, it works very well with these circular patterns, okay? So I'm gonna go into this here for a little bit. You can YouTube this thing, all right? So just type in quantum physics. There's a British lady that has a phenomenal um, explanation of quantum physics. Maybe I'll include the link in the video here. But the point is, is that uh, in a gross bastardization of quantum theory, <laughs> So what happens is, is the law of the observer effect says this, you always find what you're looking for and whatever you look upon multiplies. Okay. You always find what you're looking for and whatever you look upon multiplies. So if you start with the end in mind in a circular form and fashion, that means that the end is, I want to be free of diabetes or I want to be 90 pounds lighter than I am right now. Okay. If that's the end, then I'm going to start with the beginning it says I'm going to be 90 pounds lighter than I am right now. The end and the beginning always have to match. The middle gets sorted out with lifestyle programming, etc. Okay, but the end and the beginning always have to match. Get that point first and foremost. Okay, and the reason is, is that whatever you look at, you're gonna find. Quantum physics basically says whatever you look for, you will find. Right, so if your patient is looking for death and disease because all they do is watch the news and all they've seen is their mom and dad go downhill with Alzheimer's disease or whatever, if your patient's constantly looking for that, they will find it. You are a creator, right? The, the secret is, is that you're a passive creator. You don't have to do anything except look at something over and over and over again and you'll begin to create it. Right, it's part of who you are as this thing riding around in this physical body. Right? You have this this thing, it's called created light, this physical body, and then you have creative light, which is you, okay? In the physical body, the created light will always respond to creative light, all right? So these are things I know that most of you have never heard before, but I want you to get this because this is, this is critical in your experience on the planet here, <laughs> okay? So... If you're going to help people, you have to start with the end in mind. Circular reasoning is circular patterns of thinking are mandatory. If you give your patient a major definite starting point and then an un unknown end, you're going to lose to fate. You're going to lose to fear. You will. You're not, pow you're not more powerful than fear. Fear has had thousands and thousands of years of this linear thinking to work on people, right? And you get, what, like 30 minutes twice a week for maybe six months? not happening. Your patient has to understand that whatever they look for, they will find. So be careful with what you're looking for. You must be careful what you're looking at, right? Whatever you look at multiplies. There's another principle within that quantum heading. Whatever you look for, you find, and whatever you look at multiplies. Whatever you look at multiplies. Like this word exists um, back in these ancient cultures in the Middle East, this word is called iniquity, and, and it's a picture language is back in the Middle East, right? Back in the day. It's now been tr in, into letters, obviously, but back in the day, they're picture languages. And iniquity, we think about like weird religious connotations to it and stuff like that, but that's not actually what it is, okay? What it is, is in these picture languages, is an, a picture of an eye, a hook, and this multiplication symbol, all right? And so what it basically is is this. It means whatever the eye hooks into multiplies. These people thousands of years ago actually understood this principle that we're now understanding and coming to you know, manifestation of this knowledge base in quantum physics that whatever the eye hooks into multiplies. So be careful what you're freaking looking at, right? If you look at constantly are looking at death and disease, what do you think you're going to multiply? Death and disease. Right? This is why when a, when a doctor allows a patient to be disease-centric rather than healing-centric, you're doing them a disservice. This is why diabetes is hardly ever reversed in a medical model. They're pathology-based. Your secret weapon as a natural healthcare practitioner is the power that heals the edges of a cut together. That's your secret weapon. Right? When you can get the patient to start looking at that, magically they get better because your patients are quantum your pay, like life is not just in the physical plane. We got this quantum realm as well. That's measurable, right? And it's it's phenomenal when we get to use it the right way. So be careful what you're looking at. You got to have like quality, quality images, right? So if your patient wants to lose 90 pounds, you got to start with the end in mind. They're gonna look for the 90 pounds of weight loss, okay? And and it's interesting. 
right? So one of the things you can do is instead of saying, I want to be, you know, I don't, I want to be 200 pounds instead of 290 pounds, doctor, right? Instead of saying, all right, want to lose 90 pounds. Well, if you keep looking at 90 pounds, you're going to keep getting the 90 pounds. If you look at the 200, okay, they'll work their way down to it. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. All right. And then point them towards the power in their body that heals the edges of a cut together. The best thing you can do, the greatest privilege that you have, and the, the most responsible thing you can do for your patients is to point them towards innate intelligence. Fall in love with it, for crying out loud. Get them to fall in love with it. Whatever they look at multiplies. Make sure they're looking at the right stuff. Right? This quantum realm is just a layer of light right? that the rest of this physical reality is based off of. The quantum realm is just light potential, like particles that can turn into stuff, like physical things. If you right, knock on the desk you're sitting at right now, you can, you can turn light into physical things, right? Or it gets turned into energy, like light energy, right? Super cool. So anyway, um, the video that is on YouTube right now with this episode is interesting. All it is is the quantum realm on a loop over and over and over. And I put it in there just as a representation of what I would look at as the quantum realm. It's just a bunch of light particles that are waiting for you, the beingness, you, remember, right, that energy that surrounds your body, the electric magnetic field is interacting with this light field, this quantum realm that you're seeing. And things are coming to pass because you are a passive creator and you don't even know it. All right kind of getting a little heavy here, right? <laughs> so this works good and bad. It doesn't matter either way. All right. Works for the good and it works for the bad. So careful what you're choosing. Choose good, right? Choose quality things. Be an intentional creator of reality rather than a passive creator of reality. All right. Relating to the quantum realm, the stuff that I'm talking about here is the key to being the best coach that you can possibly be. It's about being what you're selling rather than just knowing what you're selling. Okay, nobody wants to take six pack, uh, like get a six pack recommendations, all right, and how to have washboard abs from somebody that's 400 pounds, right? You want to be what you're selling. Now, what if you're selling wellness? Okay, wellness is not just physical wellness. You can have physical wellness, but everybody knows when you're a psychopath, right? They can just feel it. It's super important, all right? So relating to the quantum realm is the key to being the best coach that you can possibly be. Have a clear intention. Know what you want from the beginning, all right? Know what, you, know what you're looking for because you're always going to find it. Then fall in love with it. When there's only one outcome possible because of that circular reasoning, the end equals the beginning, right? That creates thankfulness, and thankfulness is super creative, uh, a super creative vehicle for you and your patients, right? One outcome with one choice, right? But when you're linear thinking and the future's unknown, you have a ton of choices and a ton of different outcomes, and that's a problem. So you just gotta be specific. You have to be willing to forsake all the other options, right? If you're gonna get down to 200 pounds from 290, you have to be willing to forsake that you could stop and plateau at 225. You forsake that option, right? You have to be willing to kill the sacred cows that say anything is possible. Fear says anything is possible, right? But certainty says, oh, the outcome I desired is the only thing that's going to happen. And it's cool, all right? It's super cool. So these, this is just a little foray into how to become a better coach, right, instead of a dictator. Dictators are linear, right? Dictators are linear, and they operate in force. We don't want to do that. Right? I want you to inspire patience by digging in on this quantum reality a little bit here. Right? Remember, you always find what you're looking for, and whatever you look at multiplies. So be careful what you're looking for. Right? Know what you're looking for. And be careful what you're looking at. It's going to continue to multiply. All right. Any questions, email me. All right? Brad at biogenetics.com. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day. Get inspired. Actually look into this quantum realm stuff. Okay? It's the next iteration of how people are going to be helped. It's what stem cells work on, right? It's phenomenal, right? And uh, I was talking with a, a director of a stem cell lab a few weeks ago. And this guy says, 
stem cells are going to be replacing pharmaceuticals at some point, and that's why the pharmaceutical industry is suppressing the use of stem cells, right? More and more hurdles every single day. And until the government is able to allow these stem cells to be monetized the right way so they can get their cut, right? Stem cells are going to be suppressed. But I'm telling you right now, as a natural health care provider, stem cells operate off of this principle, right? If you just know what to do, but you're not doing it, and then you get stem cells put in your body, they respond according to your beingness, not what you know. Get that in your head here, and it's it'll change your life, okay? It'll change your life. So, all right. So anytime, remember, anytime you get information like this, stuff that you may have never heard before, you're like, wow, that is crazy. Dr. Watts, you're like a weirdo, right? <laughs> all right, that's fine. I'll own it. I love it, all right? It's changed my life. It's changing the lives of the people that I serve, and, um, and it's phenomenal, right? But anytime you have an opportunity to get this information, new information that has an opportunity to affect who you are as a human being, two choices. One, deny it. Nah, I'm good where I'm at. I'm just going to keep trying to solve new and different problems with the same old tools and stuff that I've been using for a long time. All right. Have fun with that one. Okay. Um, Or you can let this information get in there, change who you are, actually have an effect on who you are and how you're able to help people. That's what I recommend you do. All right. Thank you for listening to Nutrition Hero Podcast, you nutrition hero, and enjoy the rest of your day.